Well, look who we have got today on the, the Godcast. It is the one and the only one, Jimmy Cricket. Jimmy, come here. <laughs> but not that. There's here. more. <laughs> it's absolutely yes, good to be with you, Alex. Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant to see you, Jim, and you're looking well. And uh, yeah. how, are you, how are you coping with the, the old COVID situation at the moment? It must be a bit of a... Uh, yes, a yes. Uh, uh, Mrs Cricket and I, we're making the best of it. We've actually um, got a, a circular letter uh, from uh, the National Statistics uh, coupled with uh, Oxford University to be part of their survey. So we this morning the, the girls came and they give us a swab each and then we, um, we test um the back of the throat and the nostrils and then we give it to her and she asks us a few questions and so we're doing our we feel we're doing our little bit for that you know yeah and um have you managed to do any gigs or or has it been pretty i've been very very lucky i've been very uh, blessed i had the cancellations like everybody else but then at the lindine hotel in blackpool which i have a sort of have had a a, a semi-residency over the last five years, would you believe? Okay. And I do two shows a month there. And I got my two shows in in March before the lockdown kicked in. And then they started again uh, in August. We did one in August and I've done two in September, two in October. It's all so much, so, so different, obviously, to, the, to what it was. You know, we wear masks, go in, we get our temperature. We obviously do our act. We can take the mask off for that. Uh, but but I used to meet and greet people and even sell them a few DVDs, you know, take home the experience, but you can't do that. No. You may get the odd photo where you sort of do the old elbow thing and that, but it's all in and out. And of course, with the 10 o'clock closing, we go on earlier as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But at least, at least um, when I look around at some of the other acts, especially the younger acts, Alex, you know, we, we've obviously uh, brought our family up uh, so and, and paid for the mortgage and things, but some of the young acts with young families, yeah, you know, it's particularly hard on them, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think I, I find it really uh, quite distressing. And Jim, you must, you've played in hundreds of theatres, haven't you, over the years, and there's so many of them who are really on the very brink, aren't they now? It's such a difficult time for them. We were very worried about the Grand and Blackpool. Yeah. But the good news, they got a grant yesterday. So they'll be fine. They're gonna do, the, a few theatres are taking a leap of faith and doing a small production. It, they're not, it's not a panto per se with the story and the plot. Uh, some call it uh, names like Panto Land. So it means they tell a story and they do the act. It's usually a few acts, specialty yeah. acts. I have a friend uh, who's just emailed me this morning, a guy called Kristen, uh, Chris Gidney, and he's, he um, is in charge of an organization called Christians in Entertainment. Okay. And he's, yeah, he's putting a pit, uh, panto on, a small panto on Havers Hill, and the dame is coming out to uh, link uh, some special so it's basically like a variety show but it's just to keep things going yeah. you know the worry is the big worry is when people fall out of getting out of the habit of going to the theater then it's getting them back in yeah you know so we need something just to bring them in how are you when That's things get better we're going to do the real thing you know yeah it's a little bit like church jim because some of some uh you know, some churches are finding that some of the regulars are really scared about coming back. And, and there's the of concern course. That, that will they come back at all? And, you know, but, you know, I was so yeah. pleased to see that the, the grand had got that grant yesterday. It's, uh, yes. It must yeah. be a real tonic for them. And of course, you you know, Steve Royal, don't you? He's. Oh, love him. Love him. Yeah, we've been sort of cheering him on at the, the thing. And, but as I said to him on, on a, uh, when I did a, pr a private uh, message to him uh, on Sunday. I know what the deflation's like because I got to the final of a talent show in the early 80s called Search for a Star. Yeah. Now, I didn't win. I didn't win the final, but I, it gave me a good launching pad to, to do other things. And, I, and that's exactly what I said. I said, um, Steve, uh, you know, it'll be the fact that you've got to the final 
and this will be like a platform to go on to bigger and better things. Yeah. Jim, what, what, do, what do you make of, I, I mean, uh, you know my comedy mate, Chris, uh, the vicar in Moore. Yes. We, we did Britain's Got Talent. We didn't get anywhere near as far as Steve Royal, but I mean, and I really enjoy Britain's Got Talent, but I do wonder sometimes what next for these people, certainly in terms of telly. There's not, not many avenues for them now, is there? No, and that is the problem, um, Alex. When I did Search for Star, uh, if if you once you you you, uh, I mean, I had been doing eight solid years now it, it, during the clubs, and in those days, through the seventies, after I met May, and you know, we fell in love and got married, and she she was singing with her sister, but she decided to to, to get behind me and and um, raise the family. You know, behind uh, uh, an Irish, all good Irish comedians is another good Irish wife. <laughs> but um, what had happened, and and there was the work there to learn your trade, especially for comedy, working every night. You know, uh, but the brunt of my argument is is that once I got on that and, and was seen, then there was the good old days, and that was a, a variety show that came from the city varieties Leeds. It was a nod to Victorian times, but so the audience dressed up in Edwardian costumes. So it was it was great. Then we had another variety show called Starbust, and then if you could really had a good agent and I had a very good lady in London, I actually got on live from Her Majesty's oh, yeah, and live from. So you could get on shows where you could do five or six minutes yeah. of what yeah. you do best at, and that then would generate work round the clubs, but it would give you a, a foothold into theatres. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's always that magic moment when you break through and you do your first theatre tour because you're the new kid on the block. Yeah. So have you seen this fella there? He does come in and he does these and da da da, da. Oh, let's go and see him. Um, Jim, so Jim, that was a, do, you, do, you think yeah. as, so, do you think that contributes to the demise of the summer season somewhat? Because when I was a boy growing up uh, uh, in the 80s, there's nothing, my mum and dad, we lived on end of the piers. Uh, we did all the shows in Bournemouth, in the shows in in in, uh, in Blackpool. Where there was a theatre, we would go. And of course, you played Blackpool many times. And I remember um, summer seasons, kind of Russ Abbott, I recall, on the North Pier. I think he still holds the record. He did basically May to November, twice yeah. nightly, and was sold out nearly every night. And you just, that's yeah. not happening again, is it? No, no, no. That they were halcyon days, actually. Uh, they were they were wonderful days. Um, Blackpool always had a, a special um, uh, affection, people's heart, and from a from a, a business point of view too, the illuminations always give it that kick yeah. to go into November. Yeah. Whereby Bournemouth and Great Yarmouth, when you get to early uh, week in September, the kids go back to school. So yeah. they, they had a, 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 a shorter shelf life, but Blackpool had this big thing, the, the big switch on uh, yeah. towards midway through August. And then as the dark nights came in, the illuminations then began to, to blossom and shine, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, I wish I had a ready answer for why, you know, it's just a combination of factors. Life moves on, uh, uh, fashions change, I think the lull of the summer sea, the summer abroad. I think the the, the holiday flights, the, the cheap package, and they they've got the one thing that we can't match. We can match them in everything else, like warmth, hospitality, and our hotels, yeah. and everything else. But you've got that SU and that sun there, <laughs> and people will pull up with an awful lot as long as they can wake up in the morning with the sun shining. You know, it's very true. It's very true. Jim, let's just go back to. Uh, when you were a boy and, and kind of um, you kind of where did the kind of love of comedy emanate from were you the class clown or were you quite uh, yes yeah you were yes yeah yeah I, and, and I suppose I, I used to think you're the only one but when you hear other people's biographies other comedians it's a pretty much a, a, a sort of a general thing they did it to stop the bully really in a way you know when the, the guy big guy puts his dukes up and you 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 know, to handle him better. Have you heard the one about, or how are you? Oh, he's, I'll leave him alone. He's you know, a bit of an idiot. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it did. I ha it was in my genes as 
Mrs. Cricket, my good uh, Lady May says, I was zapped pretty much. Because when I look back, um, basically I, I was born in a little town in Northern Ireland called Cookstown. And it, it, it boasts the widest street in the whole of Europe, actually, the one main street. Okay. Now, my father was a publican, he owned a bar, but he was also an undertaker. Really? So he's a, yeah, so... Um, so he did and, the wake as well, did he? <laughs> he did the wake as well as... <laughs> it, he was there. He used to say to people, uh, you can count on me, I'll be the last one to let you down. <laughs> so, no, but I will tell her, this is a story that my sister told me, my older sister, sadly no longer with us. And it's one I sort of, I tell to give you uh, an idea about my, my father's uh, sort of sense of humour. He sent over to England for a Rolls Royce that he could convert into a hearse, right? <laughs> so he could give people a good send off. And... Um, the story goes, he was coming back from a funeral, driving his hearse, and it was during the war, Second World War, and there was three American soldiers who had a base in Northern Ireland, and they were thumbing a lift, right? <laughs> so he said, yeah, sure, get in the back, <laughs> right? You can sort of see this coming, really. So when they got to their destination, uh, one of them said, okay, Mac, uh, that, that, you can let us off here. And as they, as they uh, got out, one of them said, well, that was a bumpy ride. And my old man said, you're the first one to get out of there. That's complained. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so that was it. Now, when we moved, this is the big moment for me, uh, again, when I recollect. I always think of Bob Hope. Yeah. Um, Bob was born in... Um, Elton uh, down this is Essex or Kent down. But Bob's family emigrated to America when he was only two. Now you often wonder if, if his father hadn't have taken the family. Somebody like Bob would have obviously had a natural talent, but it's interesting, you know, to think like that. Because my family moved from the little town of Cookstown to the, the um, metropolis uh, of Northern Ireland, uh, the city of Belfast where he bought a sort of a, a convenience store, uh, a quite a big, it was a corner shop, but it, 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 it was quite big. It sold all groceries and everything. So I was two when we got there. Uh, I was the youngest in the family. Right. And I often wonder if I, we had a stay in Cookstown, yeah. there would only have been a parochial hall there, you see. Yeah. Um, with, when you arrive in Belfast, you're two big theatres. Yeah. And I was very lucky that my father loved live theatre. So... When I was three and four, he would take me by the hand along with my older brother. I mean, we'd go and watch the shows in the Grand Opera House yeah. in Belfast and then the Empire. And then you had all the proliferation of all the cinemas. Yeah. I actually saw a Charlie Chaplin movie in, live in, in um, what, the Alhambra Cinema in Belfast, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I'd be talking about uh, 1947, 1948. Uh, I was born in 1945, you see. So we were two when I headed to Belfast. And I always remember, Alex, there was a tram used to stop outside our shop. Would you believe I used to take that tram to school on my own? And the mummy, uh, Philomena, Frank was my father, would give me a little bar of chocolate and, and things to mm -hmm. take on the tram, wow. which would bring me down to a place called Ardoin, where that's where I felt first went to the primary school. Right. I often thought if I ever wrote an autobiography, I would call it a Mars bar on the tram. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I watched that movie, Meet Me in St. Louis, okay. with Judy Garland, and there's a great, um, they do the trolley song. Bang, bang, bang goes oh, the yeah. trolley. <laughs> bang, ding, bang, ding, bang, ding, ding yeah. goes the bell. I always think, you know, as my childhood with a tram, because they there's an ambience about a tram. It yeah. used to, rock it along and you used to used to hear that and it was uh you know it, it's so very much and because soon after that trams went out of fashion then they they had the, the buses the trolley buses and then they had the um normal buses where they took the trolleys down so it, it was uh um very much a thing of its time that i happened to be there at that time but yeah. with great warm memories you know alex Wonderful. yeah Jim, I, this interview is whizzing by and I'm enjoying it so much, but I've got loads to ask you, so I'm going to 
I'm going to get through some. So yes, um, no, you go for it. You go you, for it. Yeah. So uh, was um, was religion part of your family growing up then? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we were Catholic, Roman Catholic. Yeah. And yeah. and what was church? Was it was church um, a, a good experience or was it? Um, I spoke to Eamon Holmes a few weeks ago and he was just saying it was just dreary. And he sent his best wishes to you, by the way. Uh, oh, lovely. Yeah. Lovely. And, and he just, Thank you. I appreciate it. And, he, and uh, for some for some church, it's just a mind-numbing experience. Was it that the case for you, or have you always enjoyed church? Uh, yes. Um, I didn't, I must confess, obviously, I didn't have the, the strong faith that you get as you get older, and, and, and then because it makes you want to go. You're going because the family are there, but because they're going, you're going with them. It's still, again, that's another thing with happy memories, what we would go and all come back. And uh, I have a vivid memory of at Christmas uh, morning coming back for my toys and things. So uh, my thing would be, it wasn't um, a grind, but I didn't have the, the passion and the belief then. I was sort of doing it, but there were all lovely people that were with me. Sunday school were beautiful people. And, uh, you know, the mommy and the father, it was, it was a lovely, I came, I had three older brothers, you see, and a sister. And uh, it was all keeping us together. So in that way, I, I, I sort of, uh, and then of course, like everybody else, as you get a, you go, you into your teens, the temptations are there, aren't they, Alex? From people that say, oh, that's rubbish and, and all the different things. So I always feel for adolescents now, if they can get through that bit, because once I got then till the 19 and 20, then I, I then, I, I, I was, I suppose, an epiphany. I, um, what had happened, really, I, I was feeling unhappy. I, I'd, uh, I got a thyroid gland. Uh, I got quite, quite nervy and quite depressed. And uh, I remember picking up a book by Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, wonderful minister uh, in, in New York. And, uh, and it was how faith, the love of uh, the Lord, um, Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ and, Holy, and bringing them in they can just well heal heal mentally as well as physically and then my other defining moment was when I came over on my own again to, to uh, uh, England and I we did do a little church in Liverpool and just just prayed for the future and what I'll do and within a couple of weeks after that I came out I got a job in Ponton's holiday camp in Morecambe and uh, I got my good lady. She was only 16. I was 26. But I mean, that's what I needed then to get my head down, somebody to fall in love with and to do to do the Lord's work, really. Yeah. Uh, that, they, they were defining moments, basically, for me. Yeah. And when, when you when you when you were doing those summer seasons, would you find a local church to go to? Were you, were you oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And all the babies were small. We used to go as a family, you know. Right. Before, because I've got three, I've, or sorry, I've got four, I've got two of each. I always say two Catholics and two Protestants. <laughs> I've got Dale and Frank, two boys, and Jamie and Katie, and uh, they were. we used to take them to Great Yarmouth, um, Bournemouth, uh, any of the summer seas, usually, usually was good, or, or uh, Blackpool. And yes, that would be our thing. They, we'd, uh, we'd go to Mass, and that was lovely. Uh, that, that was that was sort of keeping us together, and of course, it it was really great that my one of my sons, Frank, is now a parish priest, a Catholic priest yeah. in Salford, St yeah. James, um, St James and All Souls in Salford. In fact, through this lockdown and pandemic, we've been able to see his mass being streamed on YouTube, uh, because you always think if there's only a few allowed in at the moment, then you're taking the place of somebody. So. Uh, the fact that, well, like everybody else, every sort of Christian, we're, we're really wanting it. It would be great to come back. And yeah. all of us what wouldn't think when, when they've got the vaccine and when, you know, that's what we're all praying for. Jim, but at the you, moment... When, uh, when Frankie announced he was going to be a Roman Catholic minister, did that come as a surprise to you? Or, or, or was it... Was it, was it um, well, he, he had showed sensitivity and a very a spiritual side and a very compassionate side. 
but I suppose it was because you could still have that and still do all sorts of things. You could have been a teacher, uh, for instance, there's some very devout uh, teachers. Um, what are, what, are what you jo job you do, uh, you'll be serving your fellow man in the service of the Lord. But yeah. when he wanted to do that, um, yeah, we, we had a chat and it was what he wanted to do because he did do stand-up for a while, you see. Yeah. He came with me, he came on the road, so he would be like a stooge for me. Yeah. Uh, in fact, he used to play. I said, look, if you want to do something when I'm on the road then, and he, he was getting sort of um, clarinet and saxophone lessons. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a goal. If you can play rock around the clock, because I had a strobe light then that I used to do dance to, and a strobe light made you go quicker. It was a, made you look Charlie Chaplin, like speed yeah. it up, like a silent movie. And so he practiced night and day to play rock around the clock. And I said, right, you're in. And so he came on the road with me as a sort of a road manager. And uh, so that was lovely. It was during that time we were down in Babacombe uh, that uh, your uh, viewers and, and listeners will obviously know. It's just right next to Torquay. That, that was a special place too, Torquay. We did some lovely summer seasons yeah. there, the English Riviera. And it was in Babacombe where he said he wanted to, he got the calling and wanted to do it. And it was tough, you know, at first, Alex, because... Frank didn't wasn't very academic. He didn't want that. He always wanted to come with his dad and the thing. Mm. So he was turned down, uh, uh, and he won't mind. Nobody will mind saying that. And because he said, "Dad, they don't want fishermen now," mm -hmm. <laughs> which was a great thing, really. Uh, but he persevered, and they said to him, "Well, look, if you can get something like an ARO level, if you can do some work in the hospital." It was a bit like me with a rock around the clock. The bishop said of Salford, said, if you can do, you know, and then we'll, we'll, we'll know that you really want it, you know. Yeah. And then what they do now in the faith is that they go over to a place in Spain called Valladolid and they have a reflective 12 months. Okay. And Valladolid is right out in the mountains of Spain. You have to learn Spanish, even to get your shirts ironed, even to, the lady doesn't know any English. Uh -huh. And, you know, so it was a great way he learned and but he reflected. And then after that, then he did his seven years, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I'm going to get yeah. I'm going to get your son. On. I'm going to get Frankie on here because uh, I was uh, I was not back in my first attempt to join uh, the priesthood. And I had a, a very difficult academic background. And but uh, yeah, it'd be great to chat to Frankie about that. And, and, and Frankie came to the show that you did for. Jack and Crack at Great Harwood, if you... That's used. right, we did a bit of cross-talk. Well, the thing is, Alex, you're living proof that you have to hang on because of what you're doing now, your personality, you are such a gift to the church and to Christianity. Oh, that's very kind, Jim. That's very kind. Jim, I I, I really adore you. I, you're, and what I love uh, about you is uh, I, I remember you as a boy. I remember watching you uh, early, and those shows and when you came to do that show for Chris and I a few years ago what I loved about you is you absolutely um well you, you've you've got you've got your art off to a T and um you don't go um where you're not what I'm trying to say is you know what works and it's all yeah. very healthy and it's lovely and it's kind and it's clean and nobody gets attacked or nobody gets insulted if anybody's the butt of the gag it's yourself yeah i love that jim and 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 you would probably be described as old school by some people but actually i think that's a load of nonsense because funny is funny isn't it mm -hmm. and it just works. yes it's a yes it's a label that i that, that i'm happy to because uh, uh, that that is what i what i grew up it was it was Ken Dodd it was Markham and Wise it was Tommy Cooper they're the people I loved so people would say they'd be old school and so I'm happy to share that label with those giants of comedy you know yeah, yeah. and there's not um I'm gonna be I'm gonna be really controversial here some stand-up comics on the telly aren't funny are they <laughs> <laughs> well you know the other day, because uh, uh, sometimes you can be blinkered and things and, uh, you, you know, you don't bother. But we came, we had, a, it was our 46th wedding anniversary a few weeks ago. And we went to a lovely place. It's called the Scottish Riviera. 
It's the best kept secret in the UK. You get to Dumfries and we booked into Holiday Inn and they have these lovely, you can do a little, you've heard of a pub crawl. It's like a beach crawl. Right, yeah. And the first one is called Sand Hills with beautiful sand. The next one's called Rockville, which has got rocks. There's one in the middle. Our eldest boy had actually done it with his family. So he gave us a list. And then what is the third? So we um, we did that and uh, bring me back because I'm so busy doing this for the tourist board in Scotland. I've lost the original question. Bring me back to it. Uh, <laughs> it was about your kind of clean sense of humour. Yes, in that gotcha. Sort of <laughs> Gotcha. We were talking about other cars. And I came back. Yes, we came back to the Holiday Inn and we turned on and Michael uh, McIntyre was on. Mm. And, and I just thought he was wonderful. Yeah. I thought, why haven't I watched this? Because he has the movements, yeah. his body language. He puts so much. You see, people don't realise how much work he ever went into those routines. Yeah. And I was, I, I just... I thought this was great. I loved him. Yeah, he is very <laughs> I funny. discovered him in a way. My, you kids, know. Love, my kids love love uh, Michael McIntyre. He is a very... Isn't he just he, good, isn't he? He is. He is. Yeah, yeah. And he's, he's, he's pretty. He's mostly clean, really. I, now, well, the night I saw him, I, I didn't see anything on Tron. I think it might have been a, just a quick throwaway for Letter Words. But everything else, he didn't need it, you see. You no. did, when they have the, the, the humour, the originality, uh, the inventiveness, you really don't need to delve into the... Um, uh, naughty stroke, no. swearing, bodily function type yeah. humor, you know, because it, it, you, there's no need for it. That's the, that's suppose what I'm I'm trying to say. Um, Jim, I just Ali, want to ask you a few more because time we haven't got an awful lot of time left. But um, I, am I? I'm hogging this. <laughs> well, that's that's the plan. That they don't hear about me. They Thank don't. You. You're very. You're very. It's just I suppose I, I uh, you know, uh, want to expand, but but I know exactly what you mean. We'll yeah. we'll have to do another one. Do part we, two then. We will. Yeah. <laughs> so, listen, I, I want you to tell me about this papal knighthood that you've got. Yes. Tell yes. me. Tell me what is this? It sounds fantastic. What is it? Right. Um, what happens is if you sort of do charitable work in the Catholic Church and you get put um, put forward. I think you need a champion like everything else. And what I did, um, I suppose, um, was I went over to Liverpool. There was We met a lovely couple when I was doing a show over there called Bill and Sue Lees. And they're just a delightful couple. And they wanted to raise funds for a doctor they knew in India who wanted to raise money to teach young students over there to help them through college and university so they become doctors. Okay. So I did a few of those and, and we sort of hit it off. And Bill's the sort of fella, even if he isn't involved in a show, if he finds out you're, you're working somewhere in Liverpool, he'll say, meet me at the rocket when you come off the M62 and I'll show you how to get there. So I would follow him with the car and he wasn't even involved in the gig. <laughs> you know, so that's the type of fella he is. So they wrote to the Bishop of Salford uh, suggesting, because of what I'd done in charity, and again, they got knocked back, not back, but they didn't get any answer, but they were pretty much tenacious in this, <laughs> which you do, because you can't start chasing yourself. That's not, no, you no. Know. Uh, so they actually, we got a new bishop here just a couple of years ago, Bishop John, and he was pretty receptive. So much so, he said, yeah. And he got in touch with the Vatican. And the long upshot of it was, my parish priest came to the house, knocked at the door, and he said, I've got that. I, I thought it was a, a birthday present because my birthday was coming up. But when he opened it up, it was a, a diploma in Latin. Wow. Signed, yeah, by Pope Francis. Um, it could have been a secretary or a cardinal there, but it's it's my real name, James Joseph Mulgrew in Latin. Giacomi, I think, was the first name. We got that. And of course, it's just bowls you over mm -hmm. um, that they absolutely villains have taken the trouble. The bishops thought too, because obviously you don't throw them away like food parcels, you know. No. And um yeah, and, and that's that's really how it all came about. Yeah, Alex, you, you know? Have you ever met Pope Francis? 
Jimmy's a... No, no, because I was on the, the television programme, Pointless. Ah. And uh, Alex asked me about that. And he said, and, and did you go over to Rome uh, for the Mass? I said, no, we just had a Mass in Rochdale. <laughs> and the studio... <laughs> The studio audience thought that was the funniest thing I've ever said. <laughs> and I didn't mean it to be funny. It was just true. Yeah, I'm all right in saying Frank Carson had, was given the same honour. Oh, that? he was. Oh, yeah. And Frank has got a lovely photograph of him and Pope John Paul. Yeah, yeah. Holding his grandson. And that has pride of place in our son Frankie's um, ah. house. Well, uh, where, you know, it's presbytery, because yeah. while he was at college, he went to uh, Usher up in the northeast, and then he went to Oscott in Birmingham. And everywhere he took, he takes Frank, because Frank was a family friend. He takes it, it, that photo of of Frank, and there's another lovely comedian from Birmingham called Don McLean. Don used to have a Sunday morning show, Good Morning yeah. Sunday, yeah, and he's sure. he's got a papal knighthood as well. Yeah, Frank Carson was a character, Jim, wasn't he? I used to work before before I was a priest. I worked for Argos, and and he used to he lived in Blackpool. And yeah. uh, some of my colleagues there <laughs> talked about Frank going there and basically doing his one man show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my favorite joke of Frank was he go. I went into a bar and a fella shouts across, "Frank, lend us a tenner." I said, "I can't hear you." He said, lend us a tenner. I said, I can't hear you. The barman said, I can hear him. I said, will you lend him a tenner then? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, we miss him because he was a one-man publicity machine. Yeah. You know? Yeah. He, and when I'd come across from Northern Ireland, the first time I come across, just to dip back into that part, because I went because Frank was, um, what's the word, uh, inspiration. He'd, he'd, he'd met that leap over and became... Uh, a comedy star over in England he was on Opportunity Knox, a talent show of its day in the 60s. So his manager uh, in Liverpool was called Ernie Mack. So I went to Ernie Mack and knocked on the door and said, you know, I want that like... I'll put Frank on the phone to you, right? So here I am chatting to Frank on the phone. I'm come over from, I'd only met him once over in Belfast at a charity show. So I'm getting his advice. And it was like a master class, Alex. He said, try and work every night. So you'll get the confidence. And when you've done your act, come back, pick the jokes where you could do them better. Maybe leave a word out of that one, but put another word in this one. And then I remember it all vividly what he said. And when it was coming to the end of the conversation, I said, Frank, thanks for your advice. And he said, it's not advice you want, it's money. <laughs> Bang. So what a parting shot. <laughs> Lovely. Lovely. Jim, we're nearly out of time, but I, I'm going to ask you to just put your hat on and just tell us a few gags. Go on, just give us a couple of minutes, yes. mate. I've loved it. Well, to you. <laughs> here we go. Everybody in the lockdown is sort of, um, well, they're on, the, uh, they're on the phone. And uh, I rang up the optician and he's no good. Well, he told me he couldn't see me. And uh, I mean, I, I couldn't believe what sort of an optician is that. And I said, uh, he said, have your eyes ever been checked? I said, no, they've always been this color. <laughs> he said, it's two pairs of glasses for the price of one today. I said, well, Mr. Optician, that is all very well, but I can't wear two pairs of glasses at once. He said, no, the second pair is if you lose the first. <laughs> and I said, well, what happens if I lose the second pair first? He said, we'll put the first pair on, have a look for the second pair. And it was the same with the railway station. I rang them up. I said, what time does the next train go to London? He said, look it up online. I mean, you know, you're standing in the railway line looking up and down. So I went to the ticket office. I said, a return, please. He said, where to? I said, back here. I mean, where else am I going to go? I said, I want to go to London. He said, change at Stockport. I said, I want my change here. But I got my own back. I bought a return ticket and I never went back. Ta-da! Oh, do you know what, Jim? You just reminded me. I, I need a laugh. I really do. It's all <laughs> gets. It's all a bit serious at the moment, isn't it? And uh, well, it is. It, it is, and uh, and, and that's why another reason why we love going out. Any any of the work that, that we get now is it's a double cheering up. 
Yeah, you know, wonderful. Um, Jim, I just want to mention this book. Uh, your son compiled it, and you're in it. And it's called yes. God, LOL. And it's a great little book. It's yes. full of little anecdotes, and I highly recommend it. And just, um, yeah, Jim, it's been absolutely wonderful talking to you. And I'd love to do a part two at some point. Yeah, but, uh, absolutely. And I send you all the love in the world from Burnley. And I hope it's not too long before uh, you're getting to more people than just the Lindeen at Blackpool. Uh, and <laughs> Jim, thank, thanks so much. Thank you. And you. Thanks very much, Alex. Bye. Jim, that was super. Sorry, Alex. <laughs>